David Campbell is the Packy J.D. Professor of American Democracy and Chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. Most recently, he has published the book, Seeking the Promised Land, Mormons and American Politics with John Green and Quinn Monson. He is also co-author with Robert Putnam of American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us. This book has been described by the New York Times as intellectual power, intellectually powerful, by America as an instant classic, and by the San Francisco Chronicle as the most successfully argued sociological study of American religion in more than half a century. American Grace received both the 2011 Woodrow Wilson Award from the American Political Science Association for the best book on government, politics, or international affairs, and the Wilbur Award from the Religious Communicators Council for the best nonfiction book of 2010. He was educated at BYU, he met his wife here at BYU, had his first child here at BYU, and he's come back to give us the first word at our conference this week. Again, please join me in welcoming Professor David Campbell. Well, that introduction broke the very first rule of political organizing, which is that you always want to set expectations low. So please wipe from your mind anything that you've just heard, because um, who knows where this is going to go. Uh, I am grateful for that very warm and generous introduction. General Jordan, it's nice to meet you and hear about the leadership that you've offered the Wheatley Institution. And it's wonderful to be back here at BYU, where I am also pleased to say I was able to purchase an actual Diet Coke in the Twilight Zone today. I even took a picture of myself with it to send to my wife just to tell her that, yes, it is true. I'm waiting for official Declaration 3 to be added to the Doctrine and Covenants that you can now buy a Coke at BYU. Um, I hope you'll allow me to just take a moment and, and tell what will start out as a BYU story and then veer into something very different. Roughly two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, I was actually in Russia. I was in Moscow, Russia, and I was reminded of the global reach of BYU when speaking at a Russian university, I ended up meeting with about two dozen BYU students who were there, um, both studying at this university and working in Moscow because uh, they all had some fluency in Russian. Um, but that's not actually my story. My story is I was there at this Russian university to talk about American religion and then to talk about American politics. And specifically, I was there to give a lecture on how American presidential elections work. And much like tonight, the room was jam-packed. In fact, they told me there were more people at that lecture, and I'm not bragging, this really was true. Um, there were more people at that lecture than any other lecture they'd ever had, which at the time seemed like a really good thing, but now I think I told them too much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's another talk, we'll save that. I want to talk today about what happens when you mix religion, secularism, and the public sphere. In fact, what I'm going to do tonight is give you two talks for the price of one. This is a good deal for you. I'm going to give you one talk on how religion is an engine of civic engagement. And then I'm going to let that thought just kind of hang for a while because then I'm going to give you part two where I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about what has happened in the United States as religion and partisan politics have been intermingled with one another. And then at the very end, I will hopefully put those two themes together. And by the end, I hope you will see how they connect. So let me begin with this first point, that religion is an engine of civic engagement. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to try to step away from the podium. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. What I'm about to show you are some results from a big national survey. 
a scientifically done, fully representative survey, survey of the American population that my co-author Robert Putnam and I commissioned for the work that eventually became Am I not recording? Is that the problem? Oh, we're good now? Uh, that eventually became American Grace, the, one of the books you heard mentioned in the introduction. What you're looking at is the percentage of Americans who belong to a civic association, which is broadly defined. It can mean lots of different things. And for those who may have studied a little political science or a little sociology, or maybe you've read a little Tocqueville, you'll be familiar with the idea that Americans are a joining people. Americans, Tocqueville said, are forever forming associations. And so there's a lot of work, generations worth, that have argued that um, the, the social connections that people make when they form these sorts of voluntary associations are an important component of civil society. So that's what the height of this bar shows you. And along the other axis, along here, we have taken the entire American population and divided them into five bins, depending on how religious they are. And we measured religiosity, a $5 word that just simply means how religiously committed people are, with a variety of questions. Some involve their behavior. Do they attend church frequently? Do they pray frequently? Some involve their beliefs. How strongly do they believe in God? Some entail their identity. Are they a strong believer in their religion? We combined all of those together and we came up with this aggregate measure of religiosity. And what do we find? Well, when we compare people who are low on that religiosity scale versus those who are high on that religiosity scale, that's the difference between this and this, you see there's a pretty big difference. The more religious people are, the more likely they are to be involved in voluntary associations. Now, I know that some of you are skeptical of this claim. You are thinking to yourself, well, religious people, secular people, they vary in lots of other ways other than just what they believe and what they do. Religious people have a tendency to be a little older. Maybe it's age that drives it. Maybe it's education. Maybe it's what part of the country you live in. Well, we've controlled for all of that statistically. So this isolates the impact of religiosity. And what do you see? Well, again, the more religious you are, the more likely you are to belong to a voluntary association. The more religious you are, the more likely you are to uh, be an officer or hold an executive position in one of those associations. The more religious you are, the more likely you are to have attended any public meeting within the previous year. How religious you are shapes whether or not you are the member, a member of a group that is specifically focused on social or political reform. How religious you are predicts whether or not you've worked to solve a community problem with your neighbors. And how religious you are also predicts whether or not you frequently vote in local elections, which I suppose has particular meaning today on November 7th as Utahns go to the polls. Indeed, we can go further and also compare people who are low and high on this religiosity scale in their level of volunteering in their community. So what this chart shows you is um, how people who are either low or high on this scale, first of all, how much volunteering they do for religious causes. And not surprising, the more religious you are, the more likely you are to volunteer for a religious cause. No surprise there, right? You'd be shocked if it was anything other than that. Uh, but what's really interesting is if you look at people who are highly religious, they're actually equally likely to be involved in, in secular or non-religious volunteering as in religious volunteering. So in other words, it's not that religious folks concentrate all of their civic energy on religious causes. They actually seem to spread their time around in both religious causes and in secular causes. Now, I have merely shown you some descriptive results. I'm not even necessarily suggesting that there's a causal relationship here. And to the extent that there does seem to be a causal relationship between how religious you are and how often you volunteer, or whether you belong to an association or whether you vote in local elections, doesn't actually seem to be driven by the specific content of people's religious beliefs. So one of the things that Bob Putnam and I 
found in our research for American Grace is that what seems to drive the civic energy that you find among religious folks are the social connections that are made within religious communities. Now, those religious communities also ha often have a moral basis to them, and so perhaps those social networks that are formed have a deeper meaning than they might in other types of organizations. It's hard to say because there really is no secular equivalent of a church. There's no other type of organization that does exactly what a church does or a mosque or a synagogue or any place of worship that is bring people together on a regular basis and give them moral instruction and provide them with reinforcing songs and stories and all sorts of culture that sort of reinforces the importance of being engage with one another, and perhaps if a secular group could replicate that, we would find the same sort of thing outside of religion. My point today is, however, not to make that causal argument. I simply want to make the point that for whatever reason, religious folks in America are highly engaged in civic life. And that's true even when we account for all the other things that might be driving that relationship, the connection between being religious and being civically involved. It's not whether they're male or female. It's not whether they have high levels of education or low levels. It's not whether they're rich or poor. It's not whether they live in the south or the north. It's not anything else like that. It's how religious they are. Whatever the explanation for it, that is the fact. So I want you to keep that in mind. That's extremely important for the rest of my talk that religious people in America are highly civically involved. Civil society in America would be a completely different thing if we did not have the kind of religious infrastructure that we do within the contemporary United States. And that is part one of my talk. So this is like that moment when you're watching, when you're binge watching something on Netflix and you're waiting to move from one episode to the next, and there's the countdown, five, four, and you're tapping to you know, get to the next program. So this is it. Now we're going to move to part two, to the second episode, and I promise I'm going to tie it all together by the time we get to the end. Because what I want to talk with you about now is not civic involvement, which may or may not have any political content. Now I want to actually talk about religion and politics the two things your mother told you never to talk about in polite company. I actually make my living talking about the two things that you're never supposed to talk about in polite company. And I've titled this section The Backlash, and you'll see why in a few minutes, because I want to suggest to you that mixing religion and partisan politics is actually a very dangerous idea and has some consequences that those who do engage in this mixture perhaps did not anticipate. Let me set the scene here by describing for you a little bit about the religious landscape in America. Because you see, there is a myth that is often perpetrated about religion in America. And the myth is that America was once a highly religious country and it's been downhill ever since. At the time of the founding, Americans were very religious and ever since we've seen a decline in the level of religiosity in the United States. But our best available evidence suggests that that's actually not true. There are some who actually argue that it goes exactly the opposite way, that 200 and some years ago Americans weren't very religious and it's been on the upswing ever since. I don't myself subscribe to that theory. Instead, I would rather that we consider the role of religion in American society to, to be a matter of ebbs and flows. It has moments where religion is in a boom period and a period when it's in a bust. And just to give you a sense of that in the last so 60 years or so, I want to show you some data from the Gallup poll. This happens to be a very useful cultural barometer. So I'm just going to show the results of one question that the Gallup poll has asked consistently going all the way back to the 1950s. But I assure you that what we learn from this one question that Gallup asks, again, a representative sample of the American population, <laughs> is itself a good indicator of lots of other things that I could show you, like how frequently people attend church, or whether there's a lot of church construction, or what the levels of religious publishing are, however else you might want to measure Americans' level of religious commitment. This turns out to be a very useful barometer. And the barometer is very simple. Gallup, all the way back 
uh, from the 1950s has asked Americans, the influence of religion on American life, is it increasing or is it decreasing? And you can see that back in the mid-1950s, when Gallup asked that question, an overwhelming majority of Americans said that the role of religion in American life was increasing. And by every other indicator, they were right. That the 1950s were a high point for the role of religion in American society. Americans were attending church at record levels. They reported record levels of belief in God. Churches were being constructed at a pace we had never seen before. Some historians believe that this is the high point ever in American history for religiosity. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. It was you know, the immediate wake of the Second World War when all those GIs got married and moved to the suburbs. It was the Cold War, and so religion was actually an expression of patriotism and in, in opposition to the atheistic so Soviet Union. That was certainly a part of the story. But whatever the explanation, it was a high point of religion. And so if I was giving this talk in 1955, it would appear as though America was just going to remain this highly religious country because that's what people saw when they looked out around them. But then came this period that you may have heard of, known as the 1960s, <laughs> which somewhat ironically actually stretches beyond the 1960s. So the period that we call the 60s actually stretched into the 1970s. So historians do this little linguistic trick, and they refer to it to as the long 60s, which really means the 60s and 70s. But I'll just call it the 60s. Um, and what happened in the 1960s? Well, all sorts of stuff. Um, but you can sort of sum it up as this was the era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right? This is when, uh, in particular, attitudes towards sexual mores changed dramatically in the United States. And either as a cause or as a consequence, all sorts of indicators of the role of religion in society, in American society, began to decline, such that when Gallup asked that same question in the 1960s and early 1970s, is the role of religion increasing or decreasing? Now, a very small percentage of Americans said, it was increasing. They saw religion as on the decline, and again, they were right. So if I was giving this talk, Bob Putnam and I call the first aftershock. And so from the period of roughly the mid-1970s all the way through the late 1990s, we began to see an upswing in the role of religion in American society. It was largely concentrated among white evangelical Protestants, where we saw a growth not only numerically in white evangelical Protestants around the country, but also in their cultural prominence. And we saw the emergence of the political movement, the religious right. That all happened in this period. And so it sort of appeared as though America was you know, back on the path toward higher religiosity. And it never got to the same point that it was in the 1950s, but it certainly wasn't declining anymore. And so if I were giving this talk in, say, 1988, it might have seemed as though America was on this upward incline. But that's not what happened. Instead, we began to see, in, beginning in roughly 1990-ish, a sharp decline, once again, in the role of religion in American society. In fact, this time, we began to see it manifested in all sorts of ways in American society, including so this period here is what this graph covers, or, 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 or this part of the graph. What this shows you is the percentage of Americans over the last 40-ish years who either say they have no religion, say they never attend religious worship, or that they don't believe in God. And you can see that in all three of those cases, there has been an increase. Now, the patterns are not exactly the same. These two lines are sharply increasing, and the inflection point comes at roughly the same time. Here, this is the belief in or non-belief in God. The increase is not quite as sharp, but it is certainly moving upward. Now, this is a puzzle. This is the sort of thing that people like me in social science want to try to explain what is going on here. Why do we see this increase in secularism, or at least we could say a pulling away from religion? 
And there are a variety of explanations that have been offered. Your brain's probably racing right now, thinking what those might be. The end of the Cold War happened. Um, can't be the internet. The internet came later. Um, there are lots of other things that were changing in American society. And I don't actually dismiss those things. I think those are all important or what we might call enabling conditions for what I see and hope to convince you of as, if not the primary cause, certainly one of the key causes of this turn away from religion. And that is the mixture of religion and partisan politics. Because the period in which we've seen the increases in those who say they have no religious affiliation, who are known as the nuns, now, I am from Notre Dame, so I need to make sure people are clear on what I mean by a nun. I don't mean an N-U-N kind of nun, but an N-O-N-E, someone who, when asked what their religion is, checks the box, nun. I don't have one. So we see that increase. We see the increase in people not attending worship, and then we, again, see a slightly delayed increase in people saying that they have no religious affiliation. And so I want to try to convince you that this period can be explained by the mixture of religion and partisan politics, and specifically the rise of the religious right. And so if the 60s were a shock to our system, and that growth in the role of religion was the first aftershock, this is the second aftershock that has come from that mixture. And just, just to make the point, I wanted to highlight some things that we've seen in American politics in the last 10, 15 years or so. So here's some examples. Behind me is a picture of George Pataki, governor of the great state of New York at the time, speaking at the 2004 Republican National Convention. Following his speech, I was called by a reporter from the Associated Press who wanted my opinion on whether I thought there was a cross embedded on the podium. <laughs> a subliminal message encoded for those who could hear the dog whistle. Well, I'm on the phone with the reporter, and I'm trying to explain that there was no need for a subliminal message. This was a convention in which the Republican Party stopped its proceedings in prime time to have a prayer. This was not subtle. This is not a party that is using religion subtly. So I was trying to make this more nuanced point that it doesn't matter if it's subliminal. The reporter had no interest in that. He just wanted to know, did I think it was a cross or not? Because apparently if you work at Notre Dame, you become an expert in crosses. And I didn't know which way the reporter was going with the story. And if you've ever been in this situation, it's very disorienting because you, know, you don't want to be made fun of by the reporter, but you also want to make sure that you're sort of represented well. So I did the classic social science move. I completely waffled. And I said to him, and I quote, you can look this up, there is an actual story in the Associated Press quoting me saying this, that I don't know whether it's a cross, but it has certain cross-like properties. <laughs> <laughs> in that same election year, 2004, this was one of the most common flyers sent by direct mail to voters in the great state of Ohio. Hundreds of thousands of voters received this flyer in which they saw an image of a church and were told that Republicans believe in America and they were reminded that Republicans are pro-life on abortion and that they're the only party that you can trust to defend traditional marriage. You'll remember that in 2004 there were 13 ballot initiatives on the subject of same-sex marriage, Ohio being one of them. And this flyer was reminding voters where Republicans stood, but for my purposes, most importantly, they were using the image of a church. Here's another flyer also sent to hundreds of thousands of homes in Ohio saying that this election is for families. Again, they were reminded of George W. Bush's position on traditional marriage. Again, there's an image of what is probably a church. I suppose you could stretch and say maybe it was a synagogue, but I'm pretty sure it was a church. And here is a family. This is actually the world's most beautiful family. They, I don't know if they're Romneys, but they have certain Romney-like properties. <laughs> um, I like to point this out. These people are so beautiful. You notice they're not wearing shoes? Because when you're that beautiful, you don't need shoes. The rules do not apply to you. <laughs> 
those are all just images. And they actually go back a ways, of course, just to try to make the case that increasingly there's been this association of religion and one party. But let me even make that clearer, if I could, with some campaign ads. Would that be all right if I showed a couple of ads? Let's see if we can get this to work. This first one I'm going to show you comes from um, Arizona. Oh, just hold on one second. Just give me one second. All right. I think this ad really speaks for itself. I won't even give it any introduction. Just watch and enjoy. This year, a lot of folks think this is our best shot at changing Congress. Of course, that all depends on the caliber of our candidate. <laughs> Meet Pamela Gorman, candidate for Congress in Arizona 3. Conservative Christian. And a pretty fair shot. <laughs> the insiders in the state Senate wanted to have her high when she fought against their plan for higher taxes. But Gorman... She will take care of herself. Rated 100% by the NRA, conservative Pamela Gorman is always right on target. I'm Pamela Gorman, and I approve this message. <laughs> did you catch? Oh, wait. Just hold on. We'll get to Rick Perry in just a moment. Uh, did you catch that she's a conservative Christian and a pretty fair shot? <laughs> like those things just go together, right? That's what we'd expect. And you're probably thinking, okay. Professor Campbell, that's a very funny ad, and it is. But that's one obscure politician in Arizona. She didn't even win, which, trust me, broke my heart when <laughs> Pamela Gorman didn't win. Um, well, here's another ad. This is, uh, this is Rick Perry in his uh, presidential campaign. You don't need to be in the pew every Sunday to know that there's something wrong in this country when gays can serve openly in the military, but our kids can't openly celebrate as president, I'll end Obama's war on religion, and I'll fight against liberal attacks on our religious heritage. Faith made America strong. It can make her strong again. I'm Rick Perry, and I approve this message. So that's Rick Perry running for president. You might say, well, that's also you know, pretty clear in his use of religious rhetoric. On the other hand, Rick Perry didn't get very far. Another failed candidate, right? So maybe... All I'm doing is showing you ads of people that didn't capture the zeitgeist. Well, here's another. Hmm, just give me one second here. It's a fellow you might have heard of, um, Mitt Romney, running for presidency. We'll do one more. Just give me one more second and we'll come back to the show. Now, hopefully, those ads reinforce something you already knew about American politics, and that is that we often talk a lot about religion, and it's one party that talks about it a lot more than the other. And I don't actually mean to cast aspersions on either party about what they decide to do with their uh, political appeals. I'm just here to talk about what the effect is of what happens when you mingle religion with one party. Well, when we ask Americans, again, in national surveys, 
whether religious people are mainly Republicans, mainly Democrats, or an even mix of both, we find an overwhelming majority of Americans say religious people are mainly Republicans. That's even more pronounced when we ask, do you think evangelical Christians are mainly Republicans, mainly Democrats, or an even mix of both? Most Americans say mainly Republicans. So there's clearly a brand that's gone on here. The Republican Party has a, a brand as the party of religion. But my argument is that by mixing those two things together, people have been driven away from religion, in particular people who don't share those same political views. In fact, when we ask people who have left their religion, and we saw from that chart that showed the growth of the nuns, of those who have no religious affiliation, when we ask those nuns, those people with no religion, well, why did you leave a religion if they were raised in one, and most of them were, the answer that my religion was too mixed up in politics is actually one of the most common answers. But that evidence is sort of suggestive of what I'm claiming. What I'm really arguing is that there's a form of cognitive dissonance that goes on. That when people associate religion with a particular political brand, and then they're asked, what is your religion? Many of them begin to think, well, if I say I have a religion, then that will mean that I associate with that one political tribe. But that's not my tribe. I don't hold those beliefs. So I don't want to say I'm religious. Because if I did, then there would somehow be dissonance in my brain. My brain would explode because I'm trying to carry these two things in my head. So one has to go. It has to be either the politics or the religion. And increasingly we find it's not the politics that people give up, it's the religion. So why have we seen the growth in the nuns? Because more and more people, particularly those who are either in the center or the left, are saying, if religion means that kind of politics, religion is not for me. One of the ways that we've tested this is through an experiment where we have made actual fake news. Taken a congressional race that does not exist, in a community that does not exist, and written a news story that looks like it does exist, and given it to people, and have them read it. And this is an experiment, so some people get one version of the story in which they read that these two people are running for Congress, and it's sort of this very innocuous description of the two candidates' biographies. But then others get a version of the story where those candidates talk about their religious beliefs. And in some of them, it's just the Republican who talks about his religion. Some, it's the Democrat who talks about his religion. And some, both do. And we randomly assign people to read these various versions of the story. And then we just ask them a very basic question. What's your religion? Very, very simple. And believe it or not, simply by having people read one news story about one congressional campaign in which one candidate, but not the other, talks about religion, we can get a sizable increase in the percentage of people who say, I have no religion. The overall increase, just with that one story, is about six percentage points. And when we look only at Democrats, so that's the group that we think would be most repelled by the use of religion mingled up in politics, we get this stunning increase of 14 percentage points. 14 percent of people are more likely to say, I have no religion, simply by reading that one news story that reminds them of the connection between religion and partisan politics. But our evidence goes even further than that. Because you might say, well, that's an experiment, and you've admitted it was a fake news story, the campaign didn't exist. What are we to make of that? Well, we've also gone into the real world, my colleagues and I, and we've done the type of survey that we should do more of, but they're very difficult and very expensive, where we interview people at one point in time, and then we go back and find the same people and interview them again, and then again, and then again. And why is that important? Because it means you can see what happens when things change in their life. And so over a two to two and a half year period, we interviewed people multiple times, and what do we find? Well, we find that the increase in people who say they have no religion 
is almost exclusively driven by people's political attitudes and it is almost entirely concentrated among those who are either in the center or the left of the political spectrum. In other words, it is the politics that is driving the religion or actually the turn away from religion and not the other way around. So it's not that you start out not religious or start out secular and then become a Democrat or a political leftist. Instead, you start out on the political left and then you pull away from religion. And that effect is even more concentrated among those who see this connection between religion and partisan politics of the type that we demonstrated in our experiment and that you saw in these ads. So I want you to think about that for a moment. What does this mean? If my argument is right, there's this tremendous irony that the religious right as a political movement was formed to advance the cause of religion in the public square, but it has actually contributed to a decline in religious affiliation within American society. However, I don't even think anything I've described thus far is the most striking example of how increasingly Americans put their politics before their religion, or in other words, that their politics shapes their religious views. Let me give you another extraordinarily striking example. What you're looking at are the results of a question asked, again, nationally representative sample of the American population, back in 2011. Ah, the good old days. And the question asked people, can an elected official who commits an immoral act in their personal life still behave ethically and fulfill their duties in their public and professional life? This is the percentage of Americans who say no. Someone who's personally immoral cannot act ethically in public office. So this is the percentage of all Americans, a little less than half who say that. Um, uh, this is the percentage of white evangelical Protestants, and you can see the other. That was back in 2011. So I should actually say, I, I apologize, I have mislabeled this slide. This should actually say that yes, they can act ethically. Um, and so in other words, what you have are um, the unaffiliated, religiously unaffiliated, they're the ones saying that um, yes, it's okay if somebody's personally immoral, whatever that might mean, they can still act ethically. Um, and a very small percentage of white evangelical Protestants and a relatively small percentage of Catholics say that. But by the time we get to 2016, these numbers have completely flipped. So that now, the group that is most likely to say that an elected official who behaves immorally personally can still act ethically in public, the most likely group to say that are now evangelical Protestants, but you see an increase among Catholics, no movement among the unaffiliated, and of course an overall increase among all Americans. So what changed between 2011 and 2016? It's worth thinking about that. It might help to know that this survey, the second one was taken in October of 2016, right before election day. Well, What changed was Donald Trump. This was taken immediately after, very soon after the Hollywood Access tape uh, was released in which many Americans um, came to their own conclusions about our current president's actions in private. Now this is a stunning change. And actually I just want to emphasize, I'm not actually making an editorial comment about this question. Frankly, I'm not myself sure that um, we should be thinking that necessarily acts done privately will necessarily affect what people do publicly, but frankly my opinion isn't really what's relevant here. Um, my, my point is simply the change in opinion. Because I can assure you, those who are too young to remember this, I can assure you that during the period that Bill Clinton was undergoing his scandals in the White House and was eventually impeached, there were lots of people, particularly in this category and in this category, who said, no, 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 you can't be immoral in private and act ethically in public. But by the time we get to 2016, all of a sudden, that 
had changed. In other words, people's political views shaped what we might think of as a deeply seated view that would be rooted in their religious beliefs. So my point here is to highlight that when many Americans look out at religion and see it as tightly intertwined with one political party, and then they decide that that religion is not for them, you would expect to see exactly what we've observed in American society, this growth of secularism or a turn away from religion. So it's time for me now to put part one and part two of my lecture together. So I began by showing you that religion, for whatever reason, is an engine of civic engagement in America. And now I've talked at some length about this backlash, as we call it, against the mixture of religion and partisan politics. Well, here's what I want you to remember. That yes, religion is a major driver of civic engagement. Indeed, it is a major driver of political change in America. It is hard to think of a major social or political reform across American history that did not have religious roots. And that came from all points in the political spectrum, left, right, and the center. Religion's influence has been most powerful, I would suggest, when it has risen above partisanship, such as the revolution, <coughs> abolition, women's suffrage, civil rights. However, in today's environment, religion has increasingly come to be associated with partisan politics. Not just with partisan politics, but with one party in particular, and now with one faction of that one party, the Trump-Bannon element of the party, rather than the Bush-Romney-McCain wing of the GOP. And what are the consequences of that? Well, I would like to suggest that when religious believers put politics ahead of their religion, they risk betraying their own principles. They risk ceasing to speak prophetically in American society, and they risk creating exactly the sort of backlash that I have described for you tonight. However, I don't want to end on a negative note. Remember, religion ebbs and flows in American society. Perhaps its influence will rise again. But I would suggest that that would only happen if believers put their religion and not their politics first. Thank you very much. We'd like to invite those who would uh, enjoy asking questions to use this microphone over here. Uh, take a minute, identify yourself, and I think uh, we probably have 10, maybe a little bit more than 10 minutes to, uh, to take questions. Always works best if it's a short question and ends with an inflection in your voice indicating it was a question. <laughs> anyway, please. And would particularly encourage the students and those associated with the uh, conference to take the opportunity to ask questions. And David, I'll let you sure. go on. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. I was wondering uh, if you could offer insight into the ability of basically the, 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 the Christian right to bring a president to the White House, not to mention all the other victories in the Senate and the House. So it seems like they're winning, and that it's a little bit different than uh, maybe what we could conclude from this. Thank you. So the question um, is, what am I talking about? Isn't the religious right winning, right? They got their guy in the White House. Well, I guess it depends on how you define winning. So yes, Republicans have done well um, at, the, at the presidential level. Um, however, if you think that the purpose of the religious right was beyond simply putting people in office, then it's not clear that they are winning, if you want to put it that way. Because, as I've described, there does seem to be this backlash to this mixture of religion and partisan politics. But I'm not denying the fact that 
appealing to people's religious sensibilities through a partisan lens is definitely a short-term effective tactic. It is not clear to me, however, that it is a good long-term political strategy. Again, I'm not a political strategist, though, and so Republicans might continue to win with this strategy and be able to put their people in office. But I fear what it means for the integrity of those who are willing to compromise their religious beliefs on, you know, in, in favor of their politics. So that's really my message. Um, as to whether that's winning or losing, I think is a different, a different question. I will leave that for everyone to decide for themselves. Um, you talked about how uh, the Republican Party or the right has become dominated by religion and, and sort of to the alienation of those in the center or the left, perhaps. Um, but what about for those who are religious that sometimes feel alienated from the left or, you know, basically the opposite of what yeah. you're talking about on religion? Um, so that's actually a very good question because, um, for, for one thing, the, the, the flip side of what I was describing tonight is, um, while I put the emphasis on people on the left moving away from religion, we actually also see the inverse, people on the right moving toward religion. So over time, again, people putting their politics for the religion, people who are politically conservative become more religious over time, uh, which itself is an interesting phenomenon. Um, but what you're describing, I actually think, is, um, is a real dilemma for the contemporary Democratic Party. Um, it is interesting and not widely acknowledged that just as white evangelical Christians are often described as the base of the Republican Party, um, highly secular, my colleagues and I call them actively secular folks, are very much the base of the Democratic Party. But the Democrats haven't yet figured out how to fully mobilize and capitalize on that wellspring of political energy while at the same time not alienating religiously moderate voters. Um, and that is a, a challenge within the Democratic Party because while the Democratic Party definitely does have a secular element, it still has actually quite a strong religious element, particularly concentrated in the African American community. Um, and so that has not actually been solved by the Democrats. So tonight I focus mostly on the right, but the challenge you've highlighted is very much an issue on the left as well. And I think it'll be fascinating to see whether or not the Democrats as a party can figure that out, because I don't think they have as of yet. To you, what is the purpose of religious education in public schools? And what, if something needs to change to meet that purpose, what should be changed? What is the purpose of, of religious education in the public schools or and the public schools? In public schools. Well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by religious education. So uh, clearly the Supreme Court has long ruled that religious education in the sense of you know, faith promoting is not the province of the public schools. That's what churches and religious organizations do. So if that's what you're referring to, I guess that would be my answer, but I think that's maybe not what you meant. Go ahead, tell me more what you are getting at. Meaning I understand that there has been a push to have religion, or religions taught more in, in a secular way more in public schools. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of the, N, the NCSS, the National Council for the Social Studies, that has created a curriculum that involves much more with, uh, with world of religions. So I guess my question is, what is the purpose of religions being taught in public schools, not so much to promote faith, but what, if it's not to promote faith, what is it for? What can, what is the purpose of it being taught? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this question, but I will say, just because it is relevant to um, other work of mine, that um, one thing we know about building a religiously pluralistic society is that it is important that people of one faith become acquainted with people of other faiths so that they can learn about those other faiths. And we have hard empirical evidence that when that happens, levels of religious acceptance rise. So if the sort of curriculum that you're describing would enable people to learn about those of another faith, then the overall result, I would predict, would be positive. It would be a good thing. It would mean that people become more accepting of those who are of another faith. Um, if, however, the sort of curriculum you're describing is actually a way to kind of sneak religious instruction into 
the public schools, that I think would only generate the sort of backlash that I'm describing here, not only politically but also legally. Because uh, I think the Supreme Court's been pretty clear on that question. My name's Caitlin, thanks for coming out. Um, I really enjoyed your speech. Uh, my question is kind of concerning the pluralism, or not the, not the, uh, the, the partisan aspect. So, for example, a lot of like our constitution and the original establishment of this country was based on the idea ideas derived from John Locke's theory. Uh, a lot of it you can see in his letter concerning toleration, which pretty much argues that society should make sure that like it is very secular, that religion is kind of pulled out of the political and public sphere insofar as like governance and things like that. So. Um, Partially, that's definitely problematic as, we're, as we see today in politics because when you pull that out, then you have a hard time driving values, and the values that are derived often don't represent a lot of the public opinion because a lot of the public is very religious. So can you expand more on what you mean when you say like the, the problem has kind of been relying religion, religion with partisan mm -hmm. organizations? How would it look if we didn't do that? Like if it wasn't partisan and we were able to kind of align religion with either side, like what would that what would it look like to you? Because I think even the women's rights movement, at one point that was considered, considered liberal and kind of like maybe a type of heresy or something. So could you expand more on that? Well, as I said, I think religion has had its greatest influence on American civic life when it has not been associated with a party, when it's not been partisan. That doesn't, of course, mean that religious people are somehow not expressing their political views. They are, and they are doing so in a way to try to steer policy in the directions that they prefer. In fact, they may even be working within their parties to steer their parties in the direction that they want to go. And I think that's all very healthy. That's exactly what we would want to see in a pluralistic society. The danger, though, is what I was describing here, is when people put their politics ahead of their religion and are changing perhaps even their religious beliefs or uh, policies derived from their religious beliefs as a function of what their political views are. So what would it look like? Well, it would look like America not so many decades ago. So today, especially for the millennials in the crowd, it is an obvious thing. Well, everybody knows that the Republicans are the party of religion. Everybody knows that churchgoers are more likely to be Republican than Democratic, right? right? That's, you hear that all the time. You're going to hear election commentary tomorrow morning, and that will be ripe. It will be an assumption that everyone already knows. But that has not always been the case. In fact, that is a relatively new development in American history. There are many people in this room who will remember a time when there was no connection between how religious someone was and whether they identified with one party versus another. When Dwight Eisenhower won the White House twice in the 1950s as a Republican, he won just as many votes from churchgoers as from non-churchgoers. So what would it look like? Well, it would look like the way it was not that long ago. And I'm not suggesting that everything was perfect you know, in, in, in the past, but certainly we can learn from how religious people were able to speak in the public squ square without um, sacrificing or compromising their religious beliefs by working within a party and trying to shape public policy without putting their politics first. Let's see two more questions. Sure. Hi, thanks for your comments. Um, it seems by the way that you've structured some of your comments that you have implied that um, uh, increasing religiosity is a win. And I definitely agree that that's the case. Um, and that by stripping religion out of the political discourse that, that we could increase religiosity. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts or ideas about how else or if there are any other contributing factors as to increasing religiosity in the public sphere? So actually, um, I, I'm not going to take a position on whether it's a good or a bad thing that American society or any society be more or less religious. Um, I think that's actually a dangerous road to go down. Um, I think it's my job to describe and analyze um, the way the situation is currently. Um, given, however, what we know, what would lead to higher levels of religiosity, um, certainly there is a strong argument to be made for um, ensuring that there is continuing religious pluralism within the United States. Um, there's certainly a lot of evidence that when you have a more pluralistic society, you actually foster greater religious involvement, if only because the religions are competing against one another in order to win believers. Now, 
That's a contested idea. I won't say that's settled law, you know, among those who study this sort of thing, but I'm certainly persuaded that there's something there to the idea that when you allow religions to be sort of free and, 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 and appeal for believers in a, in a free society, that you're more likely to see an overall rise in the level of religious involvement. And so I would hope that anybody who themselves is a religious believer and does hold the belief that more religion is better, that they would be uh, strong proponents of ensuring that there is truly religious pluralism and allowing for you know, religions to, to uh, rise or fall as they will on their own merits. Thanks. You had some great comments tonight. Um, one thing that I was really wondering about is that as our um, society grows more and more atheist, that there's a lot of people who just have no religious beliefs and that there's a lot of diversity and that there's some issues that are super, super controversial, mostly because there's such a big conflict in what certain groups of people believe. And how do you suggest that we go about resolving those um, political issues if there's such a big discrepancy between beliefs? Well, let me actually unpack a little bit about what you said, because it's, I think, important to keep clear what the state of play is with the role of religion in American society. You're right, I showed you some evidence of this, that um, there is a rise in people who are dubious about the existence of God. There is, however, only a tiny increase in the percentage of Americans who describe themselves as atheists. So to simply say you don't believe in God, at least for some people, is not the same thing as describing themselves as an atheist. And that itself is an interesting uh, fact. And it's also interesting to note that while I was showing you the fairly high rates of religious non-affiliation in the United States, which is now roughly 25% of the population say they have no religion. That's a stunning increase. Just a few years ago, you saw on the chart, it was no more than 5, 6, 7%. Now it's a quarter. Among millennials, it's one in three. But among those people who say they have no religion, most of them actually are open to the idea of God. Many of them actually do believe in God, or at least they've not completely dismissed the idea of God. So that's interesting, because it sort of suggests that perhaps there could be another religious resurgence, right? But your question was, well, how do we, how do we resolve these issues, how the tensions between religious and secular people? This would be my response. There are many issues on which religious and secular people agree. Um, in fact, it is a myth that religious Americans and secular Americans are sharply divided on many issues. They're actually sharply divided on a relatively small set of issues. And so one way forward would be for religious folks to recognize that there are many issues on which they could form a coalition with secular folks and vice versa in order to make progress where they have that common ground. Now there will be other issues where they will not agree. No question. They will not agree on abortion. They probably won't agree on gay rights, or at least in some aspects of gay rights. And there may be a few other things in which they don't agree. How they resolve that is the challenge of a democracy. But that's not unique to religious versus secular. That's the way democracies work. And um, you know, democracies only work when there's a spirit of compromise and a willingness to recognize what is good in the other side, even if you don't always agree with where they're